live. You're live. Oh, I'm live. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I told you I was connecting. <laughs> hey, y'all. I'm James Wright, and welcome to Wood by Wright 2. Um, and we are thinking about changing the name. Um, we've thought about several of us, like... Uh, uh, w uh, was it wood by two rights? Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's also um, wood by right how to. Um, so we're, we're thinking about a bunch of things like that. And then the hive mind has been uh, messing around with that since this is going oh, to be where most of the hive. The, but my favorite. What, which one's that? Sarah's live chat and just someone working in between. <laughs> <laughs> Not the way it goes. Uh, yes. So um, we're going to be having fun, and uh, thank you for those of you who followed us over to this channel. So yeah, um, I'm interested to see what the next couple weeks are because I'm working on Thursday's video, so it's going to be fun. Um, but today we're going to be talking about hand planes and how to set them up. I've had a bunch of questions recently about how do you set up a hand plane? Well, there's, there's a whole bunch of different ways to set up a hand plane. Um, from everything from the, the fine-tuned smoothing plane that pulls off these wispy little shavings that are you know, half a thousandth or less thick. I mean, you can see the difference between the really fine shaving, and this is this is actually a pretty good shaving, but the two of them, it, they take a little bit different to fall. These ones almost go up. Um, they're, they're a lot of fun to play with. Um, we'll be doing that all the way down to the scrub plane that takes off shavings that hit the ground and go thud. Um, <laughs> as well as, you know, what about wooden planes, which I'm showing you this one now because this will be actually, um, hopefully, Saturday's video. Yay! Um, so we'll see about that. Um, but yes, we're going to be having a good bit of fun with that. So if you have any questions particularly to setting up hand planes, go ahead and throw those in there and we'll be trying to get to those. Uh, but I thought I'd show you a couple things. Okay, can you do me a favor? What's that? Can you try refocusing? You just seem ever so slightly Am out I? of focus. Ever well, so slightly. Well, this will give me a good chance to turn some things around because I want to show you something that I just purchased today. Uh, here, let me just do this because my focus is cool. going This down here are pieces to a Barnes number no. five. Um, it's actually a metal lathe, but I'm going to set it up to do uh, woodworking as well as metalworking. Um, so this is a, a fun old beast. Uh, so here you can see this is the main beam. And then there are uh, pedals back over here. Um, whoop, I'll have to pull them out here a little bit. Um, so this will actually be a pedal driven metal lathe. Yeah. And I've got a good bit of restoring view on it. So this is the, the pedal shaft for it. And we've got the big flywheel, rest, headstock, tailstock. And I am over the moon excited about this because it was a, a great deal and a, a lot of fun. So we're probably going to be seeing several videos on restoring this and getting it up and going, as well as then a whole bunch of other things happening with that. So that will be a, a good opportunity for other projects. Let me focus this before I move back. There, that will feel a lot better to you. Um, so that is what is on my brain right now is that. And then uh, this weekend, I'm actually going to be going up to Matt Cremona's place um, and coming back down with a couple more slabs. So uh, yes, he is my uh, my slab dealer. So you know, we're walking through downtown Detroit and a guy goes, you want to buy a slab? Um, <laughs> um, can you just see Matt Cremona doing that? It'd be, uh, be fun. Um, so that'll be a couple desks coming up. And then we have these, which for those of you who followed for a little over a year, we're doing the next set of glue tests. So I've got another 32, possibly 34 more glues to test. Um, and we're testing them on long grain, on end grain, on exterior conditions, on gap filling. And it's one of the most um, scientific ish um, glue tests I have, I have seen and we'll be expanding it to, uh, it'll now be a total of what, 65, 66 different glues that have been tested and compared together. So that should be a lot of fun, but that'll probably be about another month out. Um, so those are some things you can get looking, you can get looking forward to. That you, you can, can look forward to. You can to. look forward to. <laughs> But all that being said, let's actually get into the topic for today um, about hand planes. How do you set them up and what are their different uses? Um, before we get into that, let's actually talk about the different types because you can see on you know, my wall, I've got many different types of planes. But if you break planes down into one big overarching thing, it's about the length of the plane. The length of the plane 
will determine how flat the board is you can get with just using the plane. <laughs> the, the plane will only hit the high spots and will skip the low spots if it is long. However, if the plane is shorter, then it will ride up and down the hills and valleys and it will hit the low spots and the high spots. And there's sometimes when you want to do both. If you are flattening a board and you want it to all be true and perfect together, then you're going to want something that is longer, something that will just hit the high spots, not the low spots. But if you're doing that final smoothing, the final touch up on the wood before the finish goes on, then you're going to want a shorter plane, something that will ride along that and just take that final little bit of wood off the top. And so we're kind of playing with that. And one of the nice things about having a bunch of planes is that you can set them all up to do different things. Like my, my main go-to jack plane is set up with a fairly heavy cut. This is the plane that comes in after the scrub plane and flattens things out and smooths them out and just does a, a really quick job to get things close to where they need to be. The scrub plane on the other end is the, the hog. This thing goes through wood very quickly. It leaves a rough surface. Um, it doesn't need to flatten anything out, so it tends to be smaller. And it is just intended to take off a lot of material very quickly. So you usually go scrub plane to take off a lot of material, jack plane to come in and then smooth off in between and, and do a lot of your work getting close. And then you'll come into your big jointer plane, and this is where you actually flatten the entire board out. So this is taking a little bit smoother, smaller cut than your, your jack plane. And then you do all of your joinery work and you finish it up and you come back and the last thing that touches it is your smoothing plane. That beautiful plane that everyone really, really wants. And this will actually do the detailed finish so that it feels good to the hand and uh, absorbs the finish the way you want it to. So the question then is how do you set up all of these individual types? Um, so I'm going to start off with the jack plane because um, they, they all have the exact same things that go into how they're set up, um, but once you understand the basics of what needs to go to move around, then everything kind of clicks into place. Uh, now, I'm not going to be talking about the low angle plane because that's a whole different ball of wax, but the same principles apply between the two. So if you want to adjust a low angle plane, you'll just think about the same methods, you'll just have to do it slightly differently, with the exception of the chip breaker, because there is no chip breaker on these. Okay. What do you got? I'm going to, I have some questions, so I'm trying to figure out when you want me to throw cool. them at you. What you got? Well, very important question first. Alan wants to know where is his wrench for the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, no, because we're over on, uh, because we're over on Wood by Right 2, um, you haven't added any of that in. Well, no, I haven't. You can you can actually do that if, right beside their name. I can. I okay. just that makes sense because yeah. we we move channels, Alan. Yes, and uh, any of the memberships that are on the main channel um, don't drag over to this one because this channel isn't yet big enough to have memberships. Um, once it is large enough, which is currently at thirty thousand subscribers, um, then I'll open up the memberships on this one, and people can pick which channel they want to have their membership on, so they can get the locos and things like that. Um, so, but unfortunately, they don't. I can't have membership on both channels. Um, so that'll be something, sorry, we'll work in the future. But yeah, Sarah can add the, uh, the, the wrenches to those who need it. Okay, anyways, but Alan <laughs> did have a serious question. What's that? Because for once he's looking out for me. <laughs> when are you going to make Sarah a secretary desk? <laughs> <laughs> I can put that as my wish list. Yes, yeah, so the, the, yeah, we've got time. Uh, yeah. We'll talk about that. Because, you know, you don't have enough on your mind. <laughs> well, it is one of my ideas to build a Moravian bench um, and build it with a height for Sarah, so maybe she can build her own. That would be interesting. <laughs> Sounds like a really good series for me, though. <laughs> uh, do you have another question for... I have lots of questions. Um, Tiller... Any directly pertinent to what I've just said? You assume I pay attention to what you just said. I'm trying to copy all these questions for you. I have a question about sharpening and planes. Okay. I don't know. Let's save that for later. Let me get through my spiel. Well, that's why we'll I was trying to ask later. you when you wanted me to throw questions at you. Well, that's what I'm answering. No, you're deflecting. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, yeah, so there, are, there are, are three main things you need to think about when setting up a hand plane. Number one is sharpness of the blade. 
And until you experience what truly sharp is, just understand that your blade is not sharp enough. Um, you will think it's sharp, but it is not. And until you, under, you actually experience what truly sharp is, just understand that it is not. Um, and that's not something I can really explain. I have several other videos where I talk about that and try to get that idea across, but until you've actually felt it and you see what the result is, trust me, your plane is not sharp enough. <laughs> so that's, that's the most common thing. Uh, number two is the size of the mouth. Now I got a new switch because mine broke, but you'll watch this one will go black for a little bit. Oh, look, we're back. Okay, good. Um, sorry, I got a cheaper switch this time and uh, it ran into, it wasn't quite as good as I wanted it to be. So let's actually look at the mouth opening on this. And this one actually has, oh, not grab, the, grab this one. This one has a fairly large mouth opening on here. And you can see the space in between the blade and the mouth opening is a, probably about a millimeter or so. Let's see if I can get these in here. I don't even know if I can get this in here. It's 0 0.02 inches or 0.75 millimeters. So 0.75 millimeters is the opening of this mouth. And that's actually a pretty big mouth. Um, the only thing I open up bigger than that is the scrub plane. And you can see on the scrub plane, the mouth is huge. I mean, it's almost a full eighth inch. Um, I've seen some places where they're a full quarter inch. The mouth does not need to be tight on this. But even on this one where I'm taking off fairly large shavings, that, that's a big mouth. The rule of thumb is the mouth should be twice the thickness, uh, twice the size of the shavings you expect to come out of this mouth. Now because this is taking off a lot of scrub plane uh, marks and things like that, I'm going to be taking off some pretty large shavings. So something this size, is, is it's, 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 a, it's a wide open mouth. But then I get into my smoothing plane, and this one... Um, this one's actually opened up a bit. Uh, this one's not quite as, as tight as I would want for a really, really fine smoothing plane. But still, it is, uh, I don't know, ten thousandth of an inch. It, it's, it's pretty big. Um, now, if I move over here to my really, I finally set this one up earlier. Uh, the video will not show a mouth. If I really hold this up to the light, you might be able to see light coming through there. That mouth right now is at about a thousandth of an inch because this plane is currently set up to take off shavings about a half a thousandth of an inch. It's a very, very, very tight mouth. So the tightness of the mouth um, is more into the work you're expecting to do. So if you're expecting to take off large shavings, you're going to want a large mouth. The bigger you open up your mouth, the less chance you're gonna have jams. The problem with a big open mouth is that you say some really dumb things, and that is a problem that I have a lot. Oh wait, we're talking about planes. Um, oh no, you're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with a open a, mouth insert clog. <laughs> the, the problem with a big mouth is that if you run into reversing grain or changing grain, you're going to get tear out because it allows those chips to break off before the mouth holds them down. The smaller your mouth, the smaller the chips are going to be able to break off inside of there. So you're going to be able to get a better smoothing and better detail if you can hold everything down with the mouth until it gets up under the blade to break it off. The third item, and the one most often looked over, is the chip breaker, or some people call it the cap iron. Um, there are a lot of different names for this, and is the second piece of metal that goes on top of the iron. And this is, it, it, there's an interesting history to oh, the... Oh. We were green for There's an interesting <laughs> history to the uh, the cap iron, the chip breaker. Um, originally, well, here, let me grab one of these ones. This would be a good demonstration. Uh, do I have one on this? Oh, there. Sorry. Grab this one. Here's an older one. Um, so, originally, they would put a piece of steel on the back here to thicken the iron. And this made it so that there'd be less vibration. It was, it was much stiffer metal. And it would be cheaper to put a... a, 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 a a piece of iron on the back as opposed to putting a good piece of steel that you'd have on this. And it did stiffen the plate, but one thing they noticed is if you move it really close to the mouth, it actually will break the chip ahead so you're getting less tear out. And so this will actually compress the curl. So as the curl comes up into the iron, it will hit that chip breaker and compress back into the surface, holding the, break out, holding the, the tear out down. And so if you have a chip breaker, 
um, really, really close to the edge, it will actually compress the curl ahead of it, stopping tear out. The problem is if you move that chip breaker really close to the edge, then you're also gonna have the chance of getting jams. So if you have a big plane that's taking off big curls, you're gonna to want to back that chip breaker off um, an eighth inch, maybe a sixteenth inch, it doesn't have to get very close. But if you're wanting to do a smoothing plane, you're gonna to wanna to move it up to you know, a 32nd of an inch, a 64th of an inch. And on this one, I probably have it close to a 64th of an inch, which is, it's, it's a, a fairly finely set up smoothing plane, but I don't have it set up for really, really tight grain. On this one, um, I'm not gonna take it out right now, but I have this one set up um, almost to the point where you just can't see the difference between the iron and the chip breaker. There's just the, the hair of a distance, um, you know, maybe a thousandth of an inch between the tip of the iron and the chip breaker on it. And when those three things are combined together, you have those adjustments that come into place for how do you actually set up the plane. So if you're taking a big chip or a big curl, you're going to want a big mouth. You're going to want the iron, the, the cap iron pulled away from the end of the blade. Um, you're going to want, in that case, the blade doesn't have to be quite as sharp. If you're doing general smoothing and you're going with the grain, then you, you can slop on that. You, you can move things out a little bit. Like this one is set up with, uh, you know, ten thousandths of an inch, not ten, yeah, about ten thousandths of an inch opening. The, uh, the, the iron, the, uh, the cap iron is... Um, 64th of an inch away, but then I have this one set up to do ultimate fine shavings against the grain through curly wood, and this one is set up within an inch of its life, and all three of those are as tight as they can possibly be. Um, so that is the, the theory behind this, and that is one of the things you kind of have to talk through, and I want to actually demonstrate those all in a moment and show the difference and what they actually do and how that comes out. Um, but once you understand those three particular things, those are what you're adjusting. You're adjusting the mouth, you're adjusting the sharpness, and you're adjusting the chip breaker being close to the tip. And that's why if you have a low angle plane, you can adjust the mouth, and you can adjust the, char the sharpness, but there is no chip breaker. So a lot of times with these, yes, you can get a higher angle, but there's not gonna be anything in there to really break the curl. There isn't going to be that secondary angle for it to, to, to bunch, up, bunch up on. Um, and so they do make small, low angle planes, but I haven't been able to see them do quite as much as what I can do with a high angle that also has the chip breaker in there. Um, any questions pertaining to this before I dive on more? No. Cool. Um, so let me actually show you what I've got here. This is a piece of white oak, and this has some reversing and curling grain, and I'm actually gonna be planing against the grain over here to try and show you what you can do and can't do with a plane. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to get this close enough so you can actually see the difference. But with a lot of video work, um, it's going to be fun to actually try and get this on camera. But I think I can get it. So I'm gonna switch over to this one. And first thing we're gonna do is we're going to grab my, my big number five. And this is set up with the big mouth on it. And I'm going to go across this and it's going to feel horrible because I'm going against the grain. I'm taking a heavy cut. I have a big mouth. My chip breaker is away from the end and my wife needs to stop smiling every time I say big mouth. Oh, I was no, actually smiling about something completely different. The oh, problem okay. is you picked the wrong time to think I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> so I'm getting a crazy amount of tear out on this. And you just feel these curls are crunky. I'm gonna do all of that. And so I'm hoping you can see all of this horrible, horrible tear out. Let me actually bring the camera around this way and see if I can actually get in close. Is my cable long enough? Ooh, ooh, I think it is. Okay, let's see if we can get this. Whoa, what did I hit? Focus. There we go, you can see all the tear out in here and all of the, the nasty, nasty grain on here. And so that is the problem that you run into. If you ever have reversing grain, getting rid of that is, is, is difficult. Now, a couple options. Number one, you could bring in a card scraper. And with a card scraper, you can go against the grain and across the grain. And you can 
slowly remove that. And one of the nice things about a chip, uh, about a uh, card scraper, is that the card scraper is actually there's a micro bevel on there, and that micro bevel is actually the blade, and then the card itself is the chip breaker. So the curl hits that blade and shears, and then it hits the secondary angle of the card and curls back in. So it actually compresses the curl in front of the cut. And so that's why you can get that good cut when going with or against the grain. But this is really, really slow, and it doesn't always give you that nice burnished feel. So let me see if I can move this back around. Hello. And then let's actually move on to my, oh, that's why, exit, sorry. Let's move on to my finally set up smoothing plane. And with this, oop, I'm taking off every cut that I want. Back that off just a hair. With this, oop, that's a bit too much. And see, I'm just turning it just a little bit. That's all it needs. Just a little bit more. There we go. And with this, I can slowly work down past that mess that was made. And I'm getting these curls. Go just a hair more. There we go. That's getting better. And I'm listening to the board. I'm listening to the feel of it. And I'm feeling the listen of it. And I'm taking off. Each pass is a thousandth or less. Actually, each pass in this one is probably close to a half a thousandth. And I'm getting a lot of these really, really compressed curls. Where you can see they're compressing as opposed to just curling up. Because every one of these curls is hitting a chip breaker and and uh, um, accordioning to get accordioning accordioning. What's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. But then let's bring this around and show you what it looks like afterwards. Whoa. There. And so you're seeing a lot of the the grain from white oak. And it is just a little bit rough. I'm still seeing some of the tear out. I didn't quite get all the way down through, but. Where I did get all the way down through, it's perfectly smooth. And that feels really, really good. And so that's, what, that's the difference between getting everything set up tight and keeping everything loose. So now let's actually show you how to tighten that all up. Any questions on changing this? <laughs> well, Alan just interrupted this message for Sarah's Cocoa Fun and Dad Joke request. <laughs> what you got while I do that then? Oh, I... It's underneath the silver thing beside you. Ah, uh, no, but it becomes a mom joke. Um, oh, it was one I was thinking about earlier too, and now I can't remember <laughs> what it was. I try to come prepared. So what I'm gonna try and do is I'm going to set up this to do the smoothing that I just did with that and show you all the steps that need to take to move this into that. But first, let's hear the joke. When does a joke become a dad joke? Mm, what? When the punchline becomes apparent. Oh. <laughs> I got it. I you got, got it. it. You got it. <laughs> okay. So, um, number one, let's talk about sharpness. And this one... <sighs> is nowhere near sharp enough. So what I wanna show you is what all I go through to sharpen because that really is the key thing and how exactly do you test sharpness. Um, now, I don't test sharpness every time. I, I know what sharp feels like. I, it's something that I've experienced. I, I know the sound of it. I know what it looks like on the plate and I know what all it's going to go through but actually Describing the feel of the blade, describing the sound of the blade is something that's incredibly difficult. And this is a hock iron. And so I'm just going to go through this. And if you want to see sharpening, I have several videos on sharpening. I've done several lives as well. And usually that's about all I need. But this one is actually far more dull than I expected. 
So I'm going to need to do this quite a bit. Any question? Any regular question on this? Um, one? You here. Hang on. So these are going to be out of order because I'm trying to do it by the topic. Okay. Um, Aubrey Kuhn asked, when would you choose to use an extremely tight mouth single iron versus an extremely fine set double iron plane for smoothing? I hope that was related. Um, smoothing, always use the, the double iron, which is the, the iron and the cap iron or chip breaker. Um, I always, always use those for really fine smoothing. Um, I almost never use the single iron, which is the, the low angle um, bevel up plane or an, an old wooden plane that has a single iron. Um, you just you can't get them to do what you can with a chip breaker. Um, they're they're just they're at a loss without the chip breaker. So we do one plate, then we do two plates, then we do three plates. Clean that off. And I get asked all the time, how do your plates look so shiny? <laughs> um, I do one little spritz per of Windex, and then. I wipe them off, and that's how they've been like that so for years. So Tiller interrupts this regularly scheduled program uh -oh, as well. Oh, what's Tiller got? Well, he is adding to the lathe fun. <laughs> but I think this also makes his question jump because... What's that? So Tiller said he asked on Facebook about how, of, how often to sharpen. Ah, uh, yes, he did. Um, and then says he's also interested in the precise functionality or duplex of rabbit plane versus plow plane versus combination plane? Um, that sounds like a whole topic for another video. Okay, so how about his Facebook question? So sharpening is different for different planes. For my scrub plane, I may sharpen this once a year, once every other year. A scrub plane does not have to be sharp, especially if you're traversing and going across the grain. A really dull blade can do some amazing things. For a general plane where I'm cleaning up the scrub marks and I'm taking off large amounts of material, I may sharpen it after uh, two or three hours worth of work with this plane. Um, I, I let it get fairly dull. Um, on a jointer plane where it's moderately finely set up and cleaned up really nicely, I want to leave a decent edge on there. Um, I'm going to sharpen this every hour or so of use, maybe less. For my finely set up smoothing plane, I do not let it get dull. Um, it, in some aspects, when I'm doing really, really figured wood, I will pull this out and sharpen the blade oh, every five to 10 minutes even. Um, I, I do not let it get dull. I will strop it and put it back in. Um, if I'm doing regular smoothing with long grain that I don't worry about, I'll sharpen it once every half hour or so of use. Um, and a lot of people think that they should be able to sharpen a plane and get weeks of use out of it. It doesn't work that way. Um, if, if you're doing that, the blade is getting far, far duller than it should be. And uh, it, it is good to get used to sharpening a blade before it gets too dull. Because once it gets too dull, then you start fighting all sorts of problems and you run into issues that are just fixed by sharpening it. Um, so try and sharpen planes before they get too dull. Now, one of the nice things about having all these planes is, oh, that one's dull. Okay, let's use this one. And I'll use that one. Oh, that one's dull. Let's, uh, let's use this one. Let's sharpen. And then eventually I'll get to the point where uh, they're all dull. So I'll take a little bit and sharpen them all. <laughs> That's just kind of one of the common things that comes out. Um, so as to sharpen, when I, when I use these, I just I know what sharp feels like. I know what that edge feels like. This edge is really nice and sharp. The best way I can describe it is it will shave hair. A dull blade will slice paper nicely. A dull blade will catch the fingernail. A dull blade will cut hair. But an incredibly sharp blade will cut every single hair it touches on the first pass. And so with that, let me switch over to this camera and show, see if I can get this. Sometimes it comes out well, sometimes it doesn't. But zoom in, show the arm hair. So if I take this blade, every single hair it touches, it cuts. Focus again. There I was going to say, there you go. So every single hair this touches, it cuts in the first pass, all the way across. I have a perfectly smooth patch here on my arm. No hair at all. If this were dull, 
and I slid it across there and I still saw a half dozen hairs sticking out here, I'd go back and sharpen this again. It is not sharp enough because it's not hitting every single hair on the first pass. And that is the best way I can tell people over the internet that's what sharp is. Sharp is not cutting hairs. Sharp is not slicing paper. A dull blade will still do those things. A truly sharp blade will hit every single hair it touches on the first pass. Now, I don't do that with every iron because I know what sharpness feels like. Um, but to describe that to someone else, that's the way I, I do it. So let's put this together and I'm going to show you how finely tuned I'm going to get this. Uh, switch back over to two. Two. There we go. Let's back you out a little bit. Ooh, there we go. So I'm going to pull this back out here. I'm going to slide the chip breaker into place and I'm going to move it close. I'm going to move it eh, 16th inch away or so. I'm going to hold it all together and I'm going to tighten down the nut finger tight. And then I'm going to grab the screwdriver and I'm going to tap the blade. until it is right on the edge and I don't know if you guys can see that but if I tip the blade oh, let me focus it Doesn't see. focus it's not going to focus on something shiny and reflective there we go so you might be able to see that little bit showing out if I tip the blade there's just a wisp sticking out maybe a thousandth of an inch or so just enough to catch the light and then I'm going to turn around and very carefully lock that down in. And that is where that blade will be. So we've got sharp. We've got the chip breaker close to the end. The next thing is closing up the mouth. And this one actually had a fairly large mouth on it. So on a, on a low angle plane or on a custom plane, you actually have this mouthpiece you can slide to open and close the mouth really nicely. One of the things I love about the Veritas custom planes is they have that, um, as well as most low angle planes um, have that as well. But most of the old Stanley Baileys, they don't. And so what you can do is you can actually slide the frog back and forth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to loosen up these two screws in here just a little bit, about that much, eighth of a turn, if that, something around the range. And then I'm going to put the iron in Put the lever cap down, and I'm going to lock this into place. I'm going to see how close that mouth is, and I'm actually going to extend the iron until it's coming out. And now I want to close up that mouth. Because those two screws are loose, I can come in here and I can grab this screw back in here, and I can actually move the frog forward and backward. Now, some of the older planes don't have this, and that makes this adjustment very difficult. I mean, it's still difficult, and one of these screws is not loose enough. One of these screws are not loose enough. Uh, so it's, it's still a difficult maneuver, and that's why those... There you go. Tighten up just a little bit. That's why opening and closing the mouth on the low angle makes it so much easier. And so usually I, I don't adjust planes back and forth for one or the other. I set one up for smoothing and I don't mess with it anymore. So let's keep moving this. Keep rolling. Oh, there's a fly in here. And let's tighten that up a little bit more. Somewhere right in there. Come on. This just takes a good bit of time wiggling things around. Okay, let's move you back. Back that up. And so now I'm setting the depth of the iron, moving things side to side. Go a little bit farther forward. Back off the iron, it's sticking out just a little bit too much. And a lot of this is something you've just got to play with and experience. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. So now that we have that all set in place, I'm going to take this apart again. Being very careful not to touch the tip of the iron. 
And without moving this, I'm going to lock these two screws back in place. So I'm going to come back through this after the video and open this mouth back up because this is a rough plane for me. Close this all down and we can take it for a test drive and see how clean of a cut it is. Why are you not going down all the way? Ah, there. Lateral adjuster was hitting on it. There we go. There we go. Let's take it for a test drive. What do you got questions wise while I'm setting this up? Oh, there's lots of questions. Okay. We're almost through with this and we'll probably do a bunch of questions here in a bit. All right. I think you might have talked about this, so Okay. Me trying to listen in. Steve Combs asked, why don't low angle planes have a chip breaker? Wouldn't that improve them? It would improve them, but it is almost impossible to make a chip breaker that fits that because it would have to go on top of the bevel. So it would have to sit on top of the iron and then come up and over the bevel in contact with the blade. Um, and the problem with that is if the bevel changes at all from sharpening one to the other, then you'll open up a gap in the chip breaker and that's where chips can come in. And I, I've seen a few people try to make a chip breaker for it, but I've never seen one that actually works because it's such a mechanical functional nightmare. Um, if there's any, any change in sharpening, you run into problems and yeah, it's just the way it is. Um, so let's actually take this thing for a test drive and see what we get. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to be testing this on this horrible piece of wood, white oak. And so I'm backing the iron off until it's not touching at all and I'm feeling it with my fingertips. I'm being very careful not to slice my fingers, but I'm actually feeling it. Some people like to eyeball down and see where it's at. Um, some people just take shavings and play with it. And I don't want to take any shaving here at all. It's not cutting anything. It's all backed off. And then I'm going to adjust it just a little bit. Sixteenth of a turn. Sixteenth of a turn until I get frustrated and I go a little bit too far and then I have to back it off again. But as long as I'm just doing a tiny turn. Ooh, catching something. Oh my. We clogged right up. Why did we clog right up like that? Oh, shoot. Okay, here's a something else I need to talk about then. Let me clog this back up. I'm not going to be able to do it with this one because um, the mouth on this has not been adjusted. I have a, I have a Hawk um, iron and chip breaker in here, and those are thicker. So the mouth has not, been, has not been angled to fit this thicker chip breaker in there to get it that tight. So let me show you what that looks like. So, stink, I'm not going to show you on that, but here, boop, move that back over, there we go, okay, good. So on this one, this is usually a clog that is indicative of a, a chip breaker that is poorly fit, and you can see in here all of this right in front of the iron. And when I take it apart, you'll see it all jammed up right on the edge of the, no, it's not going to be on here. Right now it's, it's actually stuck right in there. And it's jammed in between the chip breaker and the top edge of the mouth. What we have is the front edge of this mouth is a perfectly straight, smooth surface. So the chip breaker is clogging up this surface here. So usually what I would do for this thicker iron is I'd come in here with a file and I would file that mouth back at an angle. So rather than the mouth being at 90 degrees to, whoop, rather than the mouth being at 90 degrees to the sole of the plane, I'd file it forward a little bit so that it would be at a, a slight angle so it'd have space for the chips to come up in and around the chip breaker to come out. Um, so because I've never adjusted this one for that, um, I forgot about having the thicker iron. So if I had a regular Stanley iron, which, hey, maybe I could give that a try. Let me see if I can do it with this. Oh, no, that's not a Stanley iron either. Um, yeah, I don't have one that's sharp for it. Um, because the, the traditional Stanley irons are much thinner, um, so the, the front leading edge of that mouth can be bigger. It doesn't clog it up as much. Um, well, stink. I feel like horrible right now. 
because I wanted to show how you could do all that. But I mean, you'll, you'll have to take my word for it. This one is set up to do the same thing. And so long as I detail it, it will take just as nice shavings when we do it. There we go. A little heavy on that side. And you always push the lever adjuster to the side you're cutting too heavy on. And it doesn't take much at all. Sometimes it's just thinking about putting pressure on there provides enough pressure. So, yeah, that is surprisingly good. This one, the mouth is open a little bit larger than this one, so I wasn't expecting it to be quite as good, but the chip breaker on it's pretty close. So that's actually really nice. I'm happy with that. Um, so, for the rest of this, I have a, there's a bunch of questions to answer, and I thought it might be kind of fun to show adjusting a, um, a wooden plane as well, though I don't have, maybe, no, that was not sharp yet. Um, showing how to sharpen a wooden plane, oh, I can do some spills with that. I'm not sharpen, how to set up a, uh, a wooden plane, because one of the nice things with a steel plane is you have all these mechanical adjustments, so you can adjust the depth of cut and the lateral adjustment, all these things with levers and knobs makes it very easy. The, the biggest problem with these is most people over adjust them. They push things too far one way or the other, or they make too big a turn. They, they have big knobs on these so you can make minute, minute turns. Let me show you actually what I'm talking about with how small a turn I'm doing. Um, so I've got on this here, and you can actually watch, watch my fingers. So I'll be, the amount of adjustment that I'm going to move this forward, if, if I think, it, if it's not cutting, the amount of movement I'm going to move it forward is that. That was actually a bit too much, actually. So sometimes I'll even do like that. That's the total movement I'm going to have on this knob. And moving the lateral adjuster, I'll think about it, I'll just do like that. That's a lateral movement. And I'll move back the other way, and I'll go like that. That's a lateral movement. Um, so tiny, tiny movements like that. Yes, there is a lot of slop in this, and there's a lot of slop in this one. So you always want to have this slop taken out so that it is pushing the iron forward. And that way this wheel is holding the yoke in place, holding the iron down. If you leave the slop here so that the pressure is pulling the iron back, you're going to use this and the iron will slowly retract and cut finer and finer shavings. So always leave the slop to the point where it's at that. Some people have actually made modifications in the chip breaker so it doesn't do that. Um, but as long as you remember just to move the wheel back until it touches, that's where you want it to be. So what questions we have well, with this? At the moment, what? they all have an idea for the one, yeah. another idea for the live episode, okay. which is a joinery plane episode. A joinery plane episode. Uh, I don't know what they mean by joinery plane. Oh, hang on. You're talking about a... A jointer plane, or are we talking about like tongue and groove joinery? Um, I don't know. They'll be able to let me in a second. And, and then it's... probably there's half the people think one way and half the people think the other way. <laughs> ah, that's driving me bonkers. I completely forgot to file that forward. Yeah, whenever you're working with, with thicker irons, you, 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 you commonly have to make slight modifications on the mouth. And I've got one here um, that's a, a prototype from DMF. That I'm really loving. It's a, it's a high angle chip breaker, um, and if you use an original Stanley plane, it works fairly well, and you don't have to modify the mouth too much. But if you put it on a thicker iron, um, you have to modify the mouth a good amount. But having that that higher chip breaker on there, I'm kind of having fun with that. So Tiller saying, router shoulder rabbit tongue and groove combination. Well, wow, there's quite a few videos in that. Maybe we'll do that next week. Oh. It sounds like fun. All right. Are you ready? Yes. Because I don't think we're going to get through all these unless you can be concise in your answers. Yeah. All right. Uh, Clockman 45S, when I put a chip breaker together, it bent the plane. It bent the plane blade. Why? Um... It shouldn't. The chip breaker, the, the the chip breaker should bend and deflect to match the iron. Um, if you put the chip breaker on and the iron deflects, that's probably because your chip breaker is thicker or a newer chip breaker than your iron. In which case, then the iron bends. 
Um, so yeah, it sounds like a bad combination between the two. Um, now theoretically, once it all goes back into place, it shouldn't cause any issue at all because then the lever cap should go on and push it all back down into place and, and hold it tight against the frog. Um, so theoretically, that should fix it. Um, but yeah, it sounds like there's a problem with your chip breaker being stiffer than your iron. So there you go. All right, Jared A. Son, son asked, "Will you still use the homemade?" Okay, we're we're these are general questions now. Okay. The homemade lathe once the new lathe is finished. Uh, from time to time, yes. the The problem with the spring pole lathe is that it takes up a huge amount of space because I have not only the treadle I'm working on, but it has this, this beam that has to come down on the far side. And so that means I have to have four feet free behind it, so I can't put this up against the wall. Um, and because of that, it also is taller and it takes up a lot of space in the shop. So most of the time I have it all taken apart and it's in a pile in the corner. Well, that means it takes time to put it together and take it apart and it just it becomes a pain to make one piece. Um, not to mention, if I'm making something, the spring pole lathe the spring pole blade can make things. Don't, don't get me wrong. It, it, it makes things, but it takes a lot of time to make things. Um, it is a much, much slower process than having a, a flywheel lathe. Um, and so I want to be able to do far more turned things in videos, uh, but to do that, I need a lathe that I can just quickly make things. And the nice thing about this is I can set up against the wall and it can have its permanent place and I can have it in the shop and use it for when I want to make things. Um, also, I want to do several tool making projects where I want to actually turn some things, uh, some metal items. And so this will allow me to do metal turning. It'll allow me to make screws um, and make nuts and things like that. So if I want to make brass fittings for something, I have the tool that I can now do that. Um, and so that will add more things into the video. Whereas the spring pole lathe, I can't, I can't cut screws on a spring pole lathe. Um, so from time to time it will come out because it is a very fun thing to shoot. And one of these days I want to do an outdoor shop. Um, and have you know a pergola with a spring pole lathe and a, uh, a, a shave horse and things like that, and in which case it would be permanently set up there. Um, but for right now, in the small space I have, it's just not a good choice for a basement shop. So okay. there's the answer. We have some clarifications to a few things from earlier. What's that? So the whole like joinery plane episode, I guess, came from a question from Matthew Dobbins about anything special for setting up bull nose slash shoulder planes or Stanley number 98 and 99s? Um, I have a whole video on the 98, 99 um, side rabbit planes. Um, so you've got the side rabbit plane here. And yeah, I, I've got an, an entire video on this. Uh, they, there really isn't that much to them, but if you think about them, the same thing. You have, to, you have to sharpen the blade. There is no chip breaker on this but you can actually open and close the mouth um, by moving. Well, actually, on this one, you really can't open and close the mouth because it's determined by the angle of the blade. Um, so yeah, you really can't adjust the mouth. It, it's permanently locked at that, um, but you can sharpen the blade. Um, but there really isn't too much to these other than get the blade sharp and then make sure you're not taking off too much of a shaving. Uh, for a, a duplex or a, a like a Stanley 68, uh, excuse me, a, a 78, um, or one of these where you have a bull nose. The the two set up exactly the same. The only difference is the bull nose allows you to get up closer to a stop. So if you have a, a stopped rabbit or something of that nature, this will allow you to get closer to the end, so you have to do less chiseling. Whereas if you have it back here on the second one, you're that far away. And so that means you're going to have to do a lot more chiseling in order to get tight up against something. So having a bull nose allows you to get right up in there, um, but still in the functionality. So having the bull nose makes it a problem because it's hard to start because you have very little to set it on before you actually start cutting. Whereas if you have it back here, it makes it much easier to start. You can set it up here and then go. Um, so yeah. But maybe I'll do a whole video on that sometime. What's next? All right, and then back to what was the question? Clockman 45s with the chip breaker and bending the plane. He clarified saying it was a new plane and it was the first time that he's ever had that happen. All right, um, yeah, uh, sounds like there's a, there's, a, there's a problem on there. No, one other thing is that it could be, I don't know you and your standards. Um, some people go all machinist on it and Whenever you, whenever you have two pieces that don't meet, 
and you put a screw in them and pull them together, they are both going to deflect some. Um, and so if I were to take apart any of mine here and put up a perfect straight edge onto the back of the iron, there will be some deflection in there, um, but there won't be that much. And there'll be enough that when I put the when I put the lever cap in there and pop it down in, it will hold it tight against the uh, the frog. Um, so if it's more than that, it sounds like there's a problem with your with your chip breaker and iron match. So yeah. What else we got? All right. Um, let's see. Sober Living with Brian Franklin asked, I have a number four as a smoother. Should I get a number three? Is that better? Um, it's really a personal preference. A lot of people like the number four. Some people like the four and a half. Some people really like the three. I know some people who think the two is the best smoother ever made. Um, it really depends on your, your detailing. Um, if you really want to do that spot cleaning and you just want to hit a small area, the smaller the plane you get. A number three and number two allow you to do that very well. Um, the four and a half allows you to smooth a wider area fairly quickly. Um, so a lot of people like that. And, and from that point on, it, it's really a, it's a personal preference. Do you want to cover a large area very quickly or do you want to just hit one area and really smooth it out nicely? Um, are you the type of person who you really want to slow down and do the absolute perfect job as, 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 as best you possibly can? Then you might want a smaller one where you can take your time and really focus in on it but it ends up being a personal preference. For me, the, the size of about a four is what I really like for smoothing. So I have a lot of friends who like the four and a half, and I have a lot of friends who like the three. Whatever you like. What's next? Um, Blue Pestle asked, I recently bought a molding plane and no matter how hard I wedge, how hard I wedge it, the wedge pops out. What am I doing wrong? Um, usually the problem with that, is that there is something in the bed or iron that is lubricating the movement. Um, so if you've ever waxed the body, don't put wax on the bed um, or on the iron. And I know some people who will then come in with a file and they will rough up the wooden bed a little bit so that it has a little bit more friction to it. Um, I know some people will use hairspray um, and they'll, they'll put some hairspray in there and let it dry and that adds a little bit more friction so that the iron doesn't back out. Um, most of the time though, um, if, if your iron is backing out and your wedge isn't, it's definitely the friction between the bed and the iron that needs to be increased one way or the other. Um, most of the time the problem is that the, the wedge actually starts to back out. Um, and that can be because the, there's less friction between the wedge and the front of the, the body. Um, and you could do the same thing on that. Or in some cases, if the wedge is a, if a harder wood, than the body, um, sometimes the, the wedge just doesn't compress as well and hold in place. And so that's why I usually try and make the wedge out of a softer wood than the body. It holds really nicely. There's kind of like a tension once it goes in there. Um, but those are, are usually the most common things that there's, there's just not enough friction in there or someone has waxed it at some point and uh, it needs to be cleaned out. Um, so don't be afraid of going in there with a needle file, a really, really fine needle file and cleaning out any debris or anything that would be on the, the, the bed of the plane itself. Um, or try the hairspray trick and see what you get. Ready? Perfect. Having fun at the spill plane. I see this. Can I ask another question? Yeah, yeah. go for it. Well, you got to pay attention. I'm listening. Mm -hmm. Spencer Goddard asks, could you describe how your auger bit holder is put together? I just got some from an antique store and was thinking of making one like it. Um, a lot of people think that I made this auger bit holder, um, but I did not. Uh, this is actually an old common design that if you bought a full set of auger bits, they would come with a box. Um, and this was one of the very common designs for them. Um, but let me show you this up close really close. Let's back up to this. Um, so, I mean, in general, the way they were made is you would have all of these pieces set aside and you would have multiple um, frames. So you would drill down through them all and you would drill out one size larger or two sizes larger all the way down in between the sheets. Um, so this is, it would be a very difficult thing to drill these straight holes all the way down 
within an eighth inch of either side. Um, I mean, it could be done, but uh, yeah, uh, I actually haven't seen anyone try to make one of these. They're just one of the box designs for how they come together. Um, I kind of like it. Most of the time, people actually will make a tool roll to hold them all in place. Um, but I don't know. They might make an interesting video sometime to try and do that. But yeah, I actually was given this one by Sarah's grandfather. Um, this one came from the Roscoe Tool Works. Uh, excuse me, not Roscoe. Um, Rockford Tool Works. They were a manufacturer that used to be not too far from here. Oh, I can't imagine how old that is. That <laughs> granddad. Yeah, uh, that one's well over 100 years old. Yeah. Gramps 93, let's just put it there. <laughs> It's a family heirloom now. <laughs> um. You know, it's very hard to ask you a question when you're doing that. I'm sorry, I'm listening. No, you're not. Stop. Cody Bryant wants to know, James, when... Joint income board and the grain changes on you in the middle of the board. What is a good way to help deal with the tarot? Ah, uh, so if you ever do like a, um, a book match where you, you cut apart two boards and you take them like this and you put them to the other way, one of these boards has the grain going this way and the other one has the grain going the opposite direction. So at the joint where they touch, you have grain going opposite directions. Um, and usually, what I will end up doing is I will get a finely set up, set up, a finely set up smoother, um, and I will just spend a lot of time taking off material until I get those two even and matched. And with that set up, if I go off onto one side or on the other, um, then I, it's not going to be much of an issue. So usually I will use a less finely set up plane to do everything, you know, an inch or so away from that joint, and then I will come in with a really nicely set up smoother and just do that, that jointed edge. And that way I can go um, against the grain at the very same time and still get a nice clean smooth surface. Um, and a lot of people do find it much easier at that point to grab a card scraper and clean it out. Um, and that, uh, yeah, it's a very delicate thing, but you have to have a really well set up plane so you can go against the grain. But have fun. <laughs> it's never an easy, never an easy joint to make. Ready? Yep. Matthew Caird Card asks, do you believe in putting your planes down on the sides or on their soles when putting them down? I, Every um, answer, why do you think that? Um, I want to do a whole video on this sometime. I know Paul Sellers has done a video on it. Um, and whenever I, put a, whenever I put a plane down, I always try and make sure that there's like some curl on the wood that I rest the toe on, not something big, like just something little. Um, it holds the iron off, the, off a little bit. Um, I do that more or less just to soothe my own conscience. But in all honesty, if I set it down flat on the board like that, no problems. Um, that does not detrimentally affect the plane. Um, there was a common thing in shop classes years ago that you always, always set the plane on its side. Um, and that was to protect the iron because rarely was the kid in the shop class the one who had to sharpen it. And so they cared more about the iron than they do about other people. The problem with doing this is, number one, is it's a greater chance that the plane is going to go out of whack because the iron is on its side. It can tilt over. Um, number two, the iron is exposed. So any tool that might go by was going to nick the iron. Number three, your hand may go by and nick the iron. Um, and number four, it's just it, it's an awkward thing. It's, it's not set up to balance that way. Uh, and so it's much easier to put it up. It's a much more stable surface. There's less chance it's going to be moving around on you to keep it flat on the, on the bench top. And so that's why I keep it flat on the bench top. And if you talk to anyone who is a, a lifetime woodworker who didn't learn their woodworking in shop class, that's how they do it. Um, it's, it is not going to be detrimental to the iron at all to set it on the iron. It's intended to ride through the wood, um, so it doesn't hurt anything at all. <laughs> I mean, how is that any different than it hanging on your wall? Or is there well, when I hang on the wall, it's actually, it's tipped in and it's actually tipped away so that the iron isn't touching the wall. Um, but I don't, I don't really mess with it. I know some people will have like a small strip on the, on the, the edge of the, the bench that's raised up a sixteenth of an inch or so. So they set it on the strip and it holds the, the plane up a little bit. Um, but in all honesty, I, I really don't, 
I, I have never noticed any detriment from setting it flat on the, on the bench top like that. And that really drives people really crazy to do that. Um, and I don't know why, but that's the way I do it. <laughs> it is not a problem in the least. Um, and I find this far more protective. Um, it protects the iron rather than having that side where you have that blade open to anything that's going by. So that is my stance on it, but everyone's a little different. Okay. I have three, four, how many questions do I have left? One, two, three, four. I have five left pulled out. It's nine o'clock. Let's go ahead and do them, unless you want to. Okay. So, if they're not one of these ones that are pulled out, I'm sorry. Send cool. James an email. <laughs> <laughs> Since it's our first one on this channel, let's go a little longer and answer some questions. And if anything, search on YouTube. He's probably answered it. Uh, let's see. Aubrey Kuhn asks, do the large plane like surf forms or auto body files compare to a scrub plane or no? No, 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 no. These are... Um, so like an auto body file or a file holder um, like this, uh, it has a uh, most commonly a float um, pattern on here. These are set up for hitting the high spots. So these don't actually like dig into the wood. There are so many points that if the, per if the board was perfectly flat, uh, they're not actually going to take off more material. These will just take off the high spots in between. Um, and if anything's sticking up, they will clean that down until it's all smooth. Um, so if anything, this is more like a smoothing plane, and because all of the teeth are at a very high angle, this would actually work far better as a smoothing plane than anything else because it really does not take off much material at all. Um, so if you, do have, if you do have difficult material or changing grains, this would actually work rather well for that. Um, but no, I would not call that a scrub plane at all. It would be closer to a smoothing plane than anything. What's next? Cody Bryant asks, why when I'm planing are my shaving rolling up and not shooting straight out from the plane? Um, that's be probably because you have a chip breaker. Um, chip breaker, as, as the, the curl comes up, it hits the iron and starts coming up. The chip breaker then comes in and causes it to curl back. And that's what starts the curl coming up. If you have a low angle plane, um, Actually, with the long angle plane, they do come up, so it may not be just the, the curl plane. Um, I think it has more to do with the the wood um, grain than anything else. Um, I, I have only experienced that once, and that is when I was using a single iron wooden plane. I had a very large mouth, and I was working on some really straight grained wood. I think it was maple. Um, and the straight grain would allow it to be stiffer, but most of the time it does automatically curl up because you are compressing the curl. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I've never actually looked into that, um, so I might, have to, I might have to look into that one. Interesting question, but yeah. Uh, Curling is the more common answer. The accordion crunch up is usually what happens for a smoothing plane where everything's very finely set up. Uh, so yeah. Sure. Alan Isaac wants to know, do you recommend using paste wax on the sole? Yes. That's what I have here. Um, so that's what I, I smooth with. Just do that, and we're good to go. Um, I, I used to use the rag in a can method. Um, it works really well. I, I've also done um, just straight beeswax or paraffin wax. Those work really well. Um, but I, I like the smoothness of the oil without the thickness of the wax. But the problem with oil is that it wipes off very quickly. The problem with wax is that it becomes thick and gummy. And so a paste wax is actually a really nice mix up. This is one that I have, it's an impregnated wax. So it's, a, it's like 50% oil, 50% wax. Um, and putting this on there, you get the smoothness of the oil, not quite as a gummy wax, but it still lasts a little longer because, because you are putting some wax on there. So that's, that's what I use. And I have a couple videos. If you look up how to make your own paste wax, you can see what I have there. What's next? All right, last, nope, sorry, two more. <laughs> Put a brain is, James, is the Hawk Iron 01 or A2 steel? Um, my Hawk Iron is, I believe it's A2. I believe it's A2. Um, I've had a lot of questions recently about what's the best. Should I get PMV 11? Should I get 01? Should I get A2? It, it, in complete honesty, 
you will not be able to tell the difference between them. You will not be able to tell the difference between them. Um, unless you are a metal expert and you know exactly what you're looking for and you, you, you've experienced the difference and you can look for the slight deviations and you know what the sharpening difference in them is, you will not be able to tell the difference between the three irons. Um, you will think you do, but if I were to put those three irons in three separate planes in front of you and tell me, okay, which one is which, you could not do it. Um, the, the, the amount of arguments that go on between what iron type you should use are superfluous for 99% of workers out there. Um, they are all great irons. Um, the biggest thing that comes into them is their tempering and how they were treated. Um, so as long as you trust the person who was the person actually um, tempering the iron and, and actually um, treating the iron itself, that is what is important. Um, not as much the, the type. So um, don't, don't overthink it. A lot of people really like to make a big deal about it, and it's just not worth making a deal about. That sounds like something fun to try, like the MWTCA or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I should really, you know, that would have been a good thing to do at uh, um, Woodworking America back when they did that, is actually have a demonstration set up where I have all, you know, like five or six different types of steels and all sharpened with an inch of their life and say, okay, which one's which? All right, so last one. Bill from NH, which I'm assuming is New Hampshire, wants to know how often do you check the sole for flatness or does it depend upon the use? Um, almost never. If, if I am restoring a plane and I'm bringing it back to life, I will check it for flatness. On all the planes I use on a daily basis, I have never, ever checked them for flatness. Um, people make a big deal about flatness, just like they do about irons. It does not matter. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about flatness. <laughs> if, if you're working with a long jointer, you will want the bed to be flat. You want to be flat at the toe, at the mouth, and at the heel, and pretty close everywhere else. And when I mean pretty close, I mean within a thousandth or two. Um, you know, it, it's, it's gotta be relatively close. If I'm working with a smoother, I want it to be close at the, the heel, the mouth, and the toe. But because it's such a small space, it, it's really not going to be something I worry about too much. Um, if I have some area on my sole that's out of, out of flat by three, four, five thousand, do not matter. As long as those three areas are coplanar, the plane will work just perfectly. Um, don't worry about flatness. Um, the, the, it's, it's not something to, to mess up. And I don't know why people make such a big deal about it. Uh, because it, it honestly does not affect the woodworking that much. Um, so I've never checked any of my planes for flatness since I've owned them actually, um, since restoring them. So if I have an antique plane that I bring into use, I will check it for flat. Um, this number six actually, I have never checked this for flat uh, since I bought it. And even when I bought it, I never checked it for flat. Um, I set it on the tabletop and go, is it flat? Yep, it's flat. We're good. Um, so this one I have never checked for flat. Um, my five and a half I've never checked for flat. My five and a quarter I've never checked that one for flat. Um, most of the other ones I have restored and so when I restored them I checked them for flat. So don't worry about it. <laughs> um, if it is, if it's my core smoother, if it's the one I really want detail on there, I will make sure that that is flat, and then I probably won't ever check it again. Maybe five, ten years down the road, I'll be like, oh, I'm having issues. Maybe I should check it. Um, but my my core jointer, my seven and my eight, I restored those, and so I made sure those are flat. Most of the time, with sevens, eights, um, sixes, they were the jointing boards, and so you'll get this divot running toe to heel. Um, where it's, it, there's a valley in the middle of the plane all the way down. And so you actually have to take off material on the sides all the way down on both of them because they've been jointing the edges of boards and so they've been slowly wearing off the middle of it. But you don't have to take off that much material. So when, when people say, oh, the plane, every plane has got to be dead flat, um, take it with a grain of salt, look at them and go, oh, okay, yeah, good, yeah. Um, and yeah, <laughs> it's the machinist problem. So another thing like that to think about, don't worry about it too much. Yes, he argues that way too. What's that? When you get very excited, 
and we have discussions. You get that <laughs> same way. There, there are <laughs> so many things in woodworking where people bring machinist mindset to woodworking, and there is no need for that. Um, it, it, whenever you start to analyze things and start bringing all these details into it, you have to stop and, and take a step back and say, does it really matter? And most of the time it's, no, it doesn't matter at all. Don't worry about it. <laughs> there's, there's far less things, to, there's far bigger things to, to think about than that. All right, on a happier note, Portal Woodworks donated and said thanks for all the knowledge. So we must. We, we got a good one here? I don't, I, we will. Oh, We will have perfect. a good one. <laughs> Give me just a minute. This is how we're going to end this. So stay tuned because this is going to be a good one. <laughs> Should I do a tap dance while you're looking? <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking the last time. <laughs> Student, why are we just dissecting mushrooms? Why? Teacher, because studying fungus is a cultured way to mold young minds. Ooh, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> so on that note, uh, this has been a lot of fun, and thank you for coming along for joining us. We will be here every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Central Time, so uh, have fun. And if you have a good idea for the uh, Wood by Right 2 channel, let me know, because we're probably going to be uh, changing that later this week and uh, doing up a few things. So We are. Lots of fun. What's that? And Oh, now I have a nickname from Alan. I am now the Wood Gnome. The wood gnome. Ooh, I the like wood. that one. Maybe you should carve a little gnome for you. Okay, Alan. There's my challenge for you. You gotta carve <laughs> me a wooden gnome. <laughs> and I will put it with me on the lives. Cool. <laughs> well, on that note, I think that's about it for today. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. Oh, I gotta find the button. Oh, now we gotta find the button because it's a different place now. Ready? Mm -hmm. Bye.